sort of a part of a much larger continuing process of investing in the port itself. So we have to continually try and keep our facilities functional, maintained, and we're always looking for opportunities to grow both kind of the condition of the stuff that we're doing, but also um, efficiency and sustainability. And those two are really connected now, where because of our size and our revenue, most of our sort of upgrades, if you will, a lot of that resource, a lot of that money comes from grants. And so we're constantly pursuing grants. So you can look at this, this is showing current investments over $45 million. Most of that $45 million came from federal and state grants because we are um, always looking for opportunities to grow some of those, those connections. So up here on the right hand side, you can see EDA paving. That's a federal grant allowed us to repave significant areas of the port surfaces. And that helps us to move cargo more efficiently, reduce potential damage to, to cargo. We got uh, shoreside power. So when our ships come in to dock, certain categories of ships, our container and reefer ships, um, with the fruit ships basically, when they come in, they have to plug in to an electrical system. Now it's not just like taking an extension cord from Home Depot and plugging it into a light socket and making the ship and saying, okay, you're ready to go. Um, those ships use a tremendous amount of power and it, it requires a huge amount of infrastructure. So in, in 2014, when the port invested in this stuff, the port had about four million bucks in the bank at that time. That shoreside power system cost almost $15 million. We had to come up with $10 million from somewhere. So we got a portion of that from the federal, the, the DIRA money and CMAC money. And um, our board came up with some, some pretty creative opportunities around funding with uh, partners like Wells Fargo, partners like the county, um, looking at some tax credits. And what those helped do were, was bring in, um, we had a food share program where it helped to fund a local food truck that would bring in meals and, and food education to the community as part of the, uh, basically, the, the funding for the Shoreside Power System. Um, we've also got a Tiger Grant. A Tiger Grant is a federal grant. That's allowed us to do some wharf improvements and actually deepen the harbor from 35 feet down to 40 feet. So that grant and project has been in process for almost 15 years, which is an incredibly long time, but it just shows that some of the permitting and federal connectivity with the Army Corps of Engineers and other parties takes a very long time to arrange. So that is set to begin probably uh, early, either late the end of this year or early next year. And the sand that is generated from that deepening is going to go on the beach. So that will help widen and replenish the sand on Wyoming Beach. So, and that is again in conjunction with both the Army Corps, the Navy, and ourselves in working on that. And that, that deepening will be, will be deepening that sort of water right adjacent to the wharf face there. It's not going to enable us to really bring in larger ships because it's not like we have a whole group of customers just chomping at the bit to bring some giant ship in here. We're actually very limited in the size of ship that we can bring in. Those huge big container ships that you see in transit out there, those are too large to ever fit into our harbor. They, they will literally never come here because they're too big. Um, what it will allow us to do is, is load some of our existing ships a little bit heavier. So they'll sit a little bit deeper in the water, but we're not really going to go into bigger ships because they, they won't fit. So this is just an example of, of some of the stuff that we have going on that connects back to that crane. So that central one where it says ZANZEF, well, ZANZEF is a, a lovely acronym. It means zero and near zero emission for freight facilities. So that is a state grant that we applied for in partnership with the Port of Los Angeles to bring in more electrical infrastructure. Because what's happening right now, and I can, I can kind of jump into this with our environmental framework, we're going to start talking sustainability. Um, we're at this really interesting time right now, globally, when it comes to logistics, supply chain, and cargo movement. Um, everybody from Walmart to Amazon to uh, Ikea, um, all the big clothing companies, big shipping companies, that we're kind of, the awareness around both air quality impacts and climate change has reached, I, I would really call it a, you know, an inflection point. The recognition of the, the need for both decarbonization and a reduction in emissions is getting to the point where the entire industry is beginning to change. 
And we're changing from a carbon-based fuel, diesel essentially, to a non-carbon fuel. And that non-carbon fuel hasn't been totally decided yet. There's a couple options out there, be it hydrogen fuel cell or electric. We're kind of agnostic when it comes to the fuel type. But what it means is that we're changing everything over. So all of the equipment on port, all of the power supply is going to go from diesel to something else. And when you think about a fuel, there's two parts of the equation. There's the equipment itself, and then there's the infrastructure to provide that fuel. So we have to change both completely. So that means re replacing or repowering all of the equipment on the port, but it also means bringing in a whole new fueling infrastructure. And so electric is really the way that the state is going right now. So when we talk about powering an electric crane, powering an electric truck, powering an electric top handler, powering more reefer rows for our containers, all of that needs more electrical infrastructure. And when you're putting in electrical infrastructure, you're not again just running an extension cord across the ground. You are digging up the ground, you're trenching, you're putting in conduit, and you're putting in huge transformers, switch gear, conduit, all of those plugs. Um, pretty incredible stuff. And you only really want to do that as, as infrequently as possible yeah, yes. because it's incredibly expensive and you, and you don't want to be ripping up the ground every two years to yeah. move stuff around. So that Zanzef grant and the connection to the crane, long-winded coming around to your, your question, um, is that we're getting the first set of, a, of electrical infrastructure to power all of our future cargo handling equipment electrification. So in the next two years, we're going to be trenching, digging, installing power to power that crane, to power future cargo tractors, to power future top handlers that move the containers around. All of the stuff out there that's at diesel right now is going to be transitioning over to electric. And this is exciting. It's not the sexiest of stuff to be putting in power, power plugs and, and transformers. But it really is like we have to do that. It's, it's the foundation change to enable this decarbonized future. And me and the engineers here and our, and our staff are really excited about this because this is the foundation of a clean air, decarbonized future for the think It needs to get more fanfare. Yeah. As a resident here, I was so proud to find out that you guys are a green port and you keep on going more and more and more towards a green port. Yeah. Pride, pride yeah. in, in living here and knowing that. Yeah. And then finding out all this, it just even puts icing on the cake. Yeah, that's great. So, <clears throat> the, this, uh, to keep going on the PowerPoint here, um, back in 2012 when our new CEO was, was selected and started working here at the port, she said, you know what? The port is amazing as it is, but we have opportunity, right? We have opportunity to grow our cargo throughput, but let's do that sustainably. Both because we want everyone in the industry to know why NEMI equals sustainable, but also because we're right adjacent to the community. There's folks who live right across the street from us. So it is the right thing for us to do. And because of that, when she got hired, she put forth, one of the very first things she did was to put forward this comprehensive environmental framework, addressing all six of those topics. So soil and sediment, talking about beach replenishment, beach nourishment from dredging, talking about air quality, electrification, emissions reductions, water quality, talking about maintaining the beautiful clear water that's in the harbor now, marine resources, talking about invasive seaweed, invasive algae, invasive species, um, fisheries locally, climate change, talking about obviously the contribution to global climate change, but also sea level rise, because that's wrapped up in there as well. And being right at the beach, we care about sea level rise. Energy management, well, energy management is wrapped up in almost all of this. Energy management is another one of those, not the most sexy of topics, but it's a, a huge topic of conversation right now. And it's something similar to that electrification of the equipment. It's happening en masse everywhere. How do we move from a carbon-based energy supply system that's structured on a power plant burning fossil fuels to produce power to one where we're using renewables, but we're integrating local resiliency in with that use of energy. We're generating locally. We're storing locally. We're producing in kind of masters of our own energy destiny, in a sense, if you will. 
Um, that's another topic that's growing like crazy and that we're very active in, in trying to talk about. So let's talk a little, little bit about air quality. Um, air quality is probably the most tangible, most direct influence on the community right here. You know, m because of the security situation, people can't come down and swim in the harbor or eat shellfish out of the harbor. But they do breathe the same air as we do right here at the port. So this is showing a graph of just what do the emissions from California ports typically look like. So per PM is, a, is particulate matter. So that is a tiny measure of little tiny particulates of combustion. SOX on the end there is uh, sulfur oxides. So those are a sulfur. Sulfur is a large proportion of what's in most types of diesel fuel. So as it oxidizes, it produces little particles. Well, the colored bars there that you can see, Wainimi is the small little green bar on the left, Oakland is the, the blue, and then LA is yellow, and purple is Long Beach, uh, Laker colors, of course. Um, <laughs> and because Long Beach and LA are, are side by side, you really need to stack the purple on top of the gold to really understand what the LA numbers look like. This is just showing in scale how we compare to some of the other ports statewide. And this is not in any way to suggest that we shouldn't be responsible for our pollution because it's so small. It's just to say different scales. About a little bit about some of those sustainability things. Um, in this slide, what I really want to talk about is that, that logo in the upper right hand corner, Green Marine. So Green Marine is a, um, a basically a nonprofit that was started about 12 years ago up in Canada in the St. Lawrence Seaway. The, there's a very heavy, you know, Great Lake, St. Lawrence Seaway maritime trade connection with the Midwest, all the grain and, and iron ore and bulk products coming out of central Canada and the central U.S. They realized that they needed a, a way to sort of let the rest of the world know about the sustainability efforts that they were employing. And this group got together and said, we could create a certification, kind of like Energy Star, to say that you as a facility were going above and beyond what you are required to do just by law. That you were stepping past just the mere compliance stuff to do extra stuff. And they said, wouldn't it be great if we had a program and a logo where participants could get credit for doing all this extra sustainability stuff? And they came up with Green Marine. And, and nowadays, 12, 13 years later, Green Marine is the world leader in sustainability verification for maritime facilities. So it's a little bit of a jargon, but it basically means that if you get Green Marine certification, you are following through on a whole series of categories, community impacts, air quality, waste generation, pollution management, spill response, this whole stuff, underwater noise, a whole slew of stuff. Um, and you're doing steps beyond what you're just required to do by law. Uh, the Port of Wainimi in 2013 was the first port in the state of California to become Green Marine certified. Wow. Um, LA, San Diego, and Stockton have now followed suit, but we were sort of the leader on that one. And, um, and we have worked really hard to grow in those categories. You can see spill prevention, community impact, environmental leadership. Um, and we've gotten some, some recognition for that. In 2017, that central picture, they have a, a large um, international conference called the Green Shipping Summit. And every two years, they vote on a, um, a greenest port in the US. And in 2017, Wainimi won that award as the greenest port in the US. And so for two years, we get to wear that crown as the greenest port in the US in recognition of all the stuff we were doing. So you can see Kristen, our port CEO there, with uh, both uh, the Green Port Award and recognition from the county. So, so what is driving some of these things? Well, things like that shoreside power system I was talking about. This is an example of, of that infrastructure, right? Those giant cables coming down, those are the types of things we're talking about having to pay for and having to transition over to. Those are the huge electrical cables that enable that ship to plug into our shoreside power system. We have a, all, of our, all of our fleet vehicles are um, sustainable. They're, they're all either propane, hybrid, or electric. Um, that's something we've been working on. Um, we have adopted uh, LED lighting across the port. We've been utilizing some really cutting edge uh, new bulb technologies in our high mass lights that uh, produce less waste heat, produce better light, and use less energy in doing that. Um, we've been pioneering some, some new storm drain filters to test out some new storm drain technology stuff. 
Hmm. Um, we have a zero waste initiative on port. So we're working internally to reduce all the generation of waste from our practices internally. So, and then another thing that we, we love to touch on is innovation and technology. We have a, a basically a, a technology maker space on port that we've been working with the Navy and a bunch of local startups on growing this capacity internally through a program called MAST, which is Maritime Advanced Systems and Technology, to really bring in uh, technologists and uh, entrepreneurs and users to have a, have a laboratory where they can use equipment, test stuff out, you know, kick the tires, so to speak, put stuff out in a very rugged maritime environment and see how it works. And in the last year, we've been working more closely with the Navy and we've brought in $3 million of you know, technical gear, lasers, uh, 3D printers, CNC machines, um, robotic stuff, lathes, all this really fancy technology equipment. And we're using it with some of these local startup groups, but we're also opening all that up to these STEM students and local schools to create that sort of connectivity back to the local schools around technology. And it's not just that, it's opportunity around maritime, around trade, around logistics jobs for our, our students. So something that we do a lot of work in is connecting with our local school groups. We brought in 1,200 students last year wow. for, for tours. And these kids come in and they're a little, you know, like, oh boy, what are we, like, yeah. not super jazzed on going yeah. to the port, but they come out, you know, with their beanies on and they're fired up around, you know, this amazing place that's right in their corner of their neighborhood that they didn't even know about, you know, thinking about opportunities. And every year, we do a high school class that's focused on global trade and logistics. And they get credit for that class, but then they have an exam at the end, and the top scoring student gets a paid internship. So Matimu, two years ago, was that, that intern. Wow, very and nice. And he went on to Cal State Long Beach, and he is studying supply chain logistics at Cal State Long Beach. So there's a whole bunch of these students who've come through the port and have gone on to go into that industry That's as really their career because of this exposure here locally to the larger global trade and, uh, and industry. Local, um, local groups and, uh, that the, the port provides support to um, throughout the year. We do a total of, uh, uh, just in Oxnard and Port Wainimi, it's about, that, that number's gone up, I think, so we're close to $100,000 in community support. Um, all kinds of different programs that are going on constantly. And then, of course, we've got the Banana Festival coming up, so we've got to plug that in a few oh, weeks. Yeah. Yeah. The, the largest free and open to the public festival in the, uh, the Oxnard Plain. We had about 11,000 people last year come out. Oh, so. nice. Yeah, it's getting big, and yeah. uh, I've we've always gone to yeah. photos and stuff. I like getting up close to some of the equipment you guys have out yeah. there. And, 